Um, thank you both so much for uh, for joining us tonight. I hope everyone out there had a really good time watching Hotel Transylvania Transformania. Um, we're here with the co-directors, uh, Derek Dryman and Jennifer Kluska. And um, it's uh, it's a real pleasure. You, you guys are our first guests of the, of the new year. So thank you so much for, for hopping on with us. Awesome, glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for inviting us. Um, I just wanna say for anyone out in the audience who wants to ask a question, just type it up in the Q&A box and uh, we will take questions um, in a few, in probably about 20 minutes. Um, but I, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for making a very entertaining film. I, th these characters are fantastic and it was really special to see their uh, human counterparts come to life. Um, so I love the conceit and um, I'd love to know how uh, the transformation for you guys happened to uh, wind up directing. I know you have a lot of uh, significant animation credits, but is this your first uh, feature directing credit? Uh, yeah, for me, it is my first. Uh, I've had a long history with the franchise. I'd sort of boarded on the previous movies um, and I've been on longer and longer uh, <laughs> the, 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 more, the more movies I was on. So I had a sort of a long history with Gendy and Sony. Yeah, for me, uh, it's my first feature. I've been, I came out of television uh, and I worked in, in uh, like Jen, I worked in feature for a while doing storyboards and, and things like that. And this is the first time uh, that I'm directing also. So Gendy had directed the first three films and uh, I'm just really curious to know uh, sort of in the career span of an animator, uh, when you make this leap to uh, being the person in charge, sort of what is that process? Do you, do you pitch the studio? Do they come to you uh, from your long experience with, uh, with the franchise? And what is, that, what is that experience like taking it to this next level? Uh, well, I think Derek and I both had directed in TV previously. We had gone back and forth uh, between feature and TV uh, throughout our careers. So I guess it wasn't so different uh, from that, eh, Derek? Yeah, it's, it's TV and feature. And, and before this, I was directing commercials um, at Illumination. Uh, it's all kind of the same thing. It, you know, it's, it's drawing, it's editing, it's storyboarding. It's, you know, kind of the whole process. Uh, just, you know, how long is the finished product you, you know but but the but the day-to-day -day is kind of the same yeah in terms of this movie though and how that sort of process developed um when i came on there was sort of already a, a rough draft that 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 gendy sort of had been working on i know gendy was very involved in the story pitching and, and sort of everything else and then sort of as we came on it sort of to evolve uh in you know more and more so i think when i came on the idea was that just there was just going to be a johnny transformation and then as i was on it with gendy it sort of evolved to like oh maybe it's drac and johnny and then by the time Derek came on i think that that only then did we sort of think well let's make it everybody and sort of really embrace this idea of change so it really evolved you know along the way we, I, I think we're sort of used to seeing um animated features have two directors, but I've never really quite understood if that chemistry is any different than when a regular you know, live action film has two directors. How do you share the work? What, what's, how does it break down in a way that might be different from what we would expect? Well, I think, gosh, that's, that's, that's a tricky one. So I think there's so many different ways of approaching it, Eric, especially depending on, you know, because some animation directors you have um, a director who is a, potentially a writer, whereas one maybe comes from the art department or from boards, whereas Derek and I, our, our history is actually pretty similar. So we had a lot of overlap. So it really was sort of very, synch you know, synchronous ah, words today uh, in terms of our, our working process. It's late, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think like Jed said, we, we're, it's unusual that we're, uh, as far as we both come out of storyboarding and drawing, I think our sensibilities maybe are a little different. Like, yeah. you know, I come, you know, Jen comes out of, um, has a long history with the franchise, um, you know, and, and for me, I'm kind of new. So that was a good, it was nice for me because I could lean on Jen for the kind of any, you know, history, history of the franchise stuff. But we, it was nice though, because we both would, you know, if one, there's always, there's a million things to do. So we were able to split up, like at some point, I worked on layout, uh, you know, camera layout, and then Jen worked on the animation. And so we would kind of 
keep in, you know, we would keep each other informed of what was happening in that department, but, but one of us would take the lead in that area so that we could split, uh, split the work. Mm. Um, out of curiosity, how, how did the two of you uh, come together? I guess, Derek, how did you, uh, coming from outside of the franchise, wind up particularly being, you know, um, sought out for, for this project? I was working, I was, I was working at Illumination doing commercials um, and that was kind of wrapping up uh, for me. And I got a call out of the blue from Christine uh, Belson, um, just talking about coming to Sony in general. And she was mentioning a couple different projects and then she, she hit on hotel four and I said, Oh yeah, I'll, I'll do that for sure. I was a big fan of the, the, the of the first movies. Um, and then you know, I think what happens a lot in animation is you just get, it's like an arranged marriage, you know, they, Jen and I met each other once and, uh, you know, <laughs> we just looked at each other like, okay, I guess, I guess this will work. And then, and then you just kind of create the, the relationship kind of evolves as, as you go with, but luckily I think our personalities were, were pretty, and we're both pretty easy going. So we just kind of gave each other, you know, it was a little, for me, I was coming in, Jen had been on it for a year, um, and had was in the middle of directing a short. And so I kind of came in and so I was just conscious of, you know, just kind of walking softly and, and just learn as I go. And then, and then Jen was really generous. I think within, I don't know, within a couple of weeks, she invited me to co-direct the short with her, which was, a you know, was helpful to, for me to, to just kind of learn a little bit of the history, you know, the, you know, the franchise history, um, you know, but every, 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 you know, relationship is different, like, like anything else. Right. I'm curious, uh, since you guys had to deal with, um, uh, recasting Drac, if that affected anything in the script stage, because Adam has such a, uh, I think a very specific voice. And I feel like a lot of the jokes, particularly in the screenplays that he was involved in, uh, really reflect that. But I was duped. I didn't realize he wasn't a part of it until at a certain point, halfway through, as I was just double checking something in, in the production notes. And then I saw that he wasn't in the film. And, uh, and so congratulations. <laughs> I think that means that you did a really good job finding uh, someone to take over the role. But was there anything um, about that that affected the, the way that it was written? Well, it definitely affected the way, well, sorry, I should go backwards. We always knew that the human version of Drac was going to be very different in the way he acted in his personality because as of like all the other cast members, like they're physically changing, like they look different. They're, they're inhabiting different bodies and so their experience is very specific whereas Drac you know a vampire is kind of on a level just a you know a human so so Drac we knew we had to find a way to express this humanity that he no longer had this power that he wasn't a monster in the way that he was sort of animated in the way that he acted and we always knew that that Drac as a human we wanted him to be a more vulnerable slightly more manic character so so the the idea that his voice changes in that quality was sort of always a thing that we knew we wanted and it sort of it definitely you know it worked in our favor but you'll find that like 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 Drac like also just like he's great like he he's just he just is so much broader and he's like, he just screams and he's miserable and he's, he, he kind of doesn't have that power. So everything about him sort of shifts and, and, and Brian was great with like sort of digging into the humanity of that character and how just like sad and powerless this guy is and all the comedy that comes from that. So we, we definitely knew we were getting into that territory. How much of uh, the, the, I guess the design of the human counterparts, um, you know, came directly from, from the two of you uh, versus let's say how they were described in the script. I'm, I'm curious from just like a pure um, artistry standpoint, you know, are you involved in the uh, uh, original sort of creation of these new characters? Definitely there was, there was a, the characters kind of became before the script, certainly before most of the script was finished, eh, Derek? Like especially the yeah, draft. We did an early pass where we were just trying to think of, you know, each each member of the drag pack, like what would his joke be for the movie uh, as, a, as a human? And so that, you know, once we kind of realized, okay, you know, Frank's going to be, he's going to turn into a handsome guy, you know, or, or, you know, Murray's going to be just an old, old, old guy, you know, like once you get the joke, then we could plug that into the script and, you know, just kind of, 
again, those guys are kind of comedy relief. They don't really, they're not really affecting the plot so much. With Johnny, I think his design was 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 harder because he, you know, we didn't really totally figure out his, once we figured out what his story was, it really said, okay, this is the kind of design we need in order to tell that story. So his, he went through a lot more variations and it wasn't just about a joke for him. It was what's going to work, you know, to communicate the, the idea. Yeah, because I think originally Johnny, there was an idea that he was actually going to be a much bigger, scarier monster. So there was an idea that like Drac is losing all of his power and Johnny is gaining power. So how can we manifest that? So originally he was going to be like a very big, powerful monster right at the beginning. And we sort of backpedaled off of that when we sort of realized that the fun of Johnny's personality is that he's this sort of like just happy to be there, you know, kind of guy. And the idea that he would just be this sort of like jolly puppy is how we sort of envisioned him. I think this was like your pitch, especially Derek, that he would just look like this kind of like gangly puppy who had whose feet were too big for him and his arms were too big and he was kind of hitting things. He didn't know how to control his body like a teenager and he was having this growth spurt. And that felt like that was more keyed into Johnny's personality as a human and then gave us somewhere to go through the movie. Yeah, and that's a good point too about the he became, you know, we, one thing we didn't want to lose, you know, because once we lose the design, there's a worry of like, will the audience be able to identify with, you know, he's, he looked a certain way visually for three movies. Now all of a sudden we're going to change him dramatically. It, it, you know, he was, we, we kind of came up with this, the idea that he's like a monster version of himself. He's, he's even more gangly and more goofy and, and, you know, and that way the audience you know, hopefully sees him and says, oh, that's the character I've known for, for all these movies. You definitely have a lot of fun with the Invisible Man in this one. And I'm curious how, how, how far you're, you're um, able to push, sort of push the envelope with that concept. If you got any, uh, if there were any parameters you had to work within. You know what, not really. I think we definitely uh, could have gone a lot further with that character. And, I, and then the fact that we got away with what we did actually, I think shocks us sometimes. Uh, that, that first reveal, which everyone has now seen of, of those sort of butt cheeks sort of coming into frame and being that first glorious reveal of the joke of the Invisible Man was, I, th I think was something we weren't sure was gonna survive for a while, right, Jerick? Yeah, I mean, you never, you know, it, it seems like, I know TV, it's a lot, there's the, I don't know, the, the, the What's the word? The word. Uh, the standards and practices are a lot stricter, you know. Um, where features, it seems like there's a little more room. There, there's always the idea that you have an audience, you have a full audience. You have kids, but you also have parents there. So, you, so you're trying to also give jokes that that you know a 30 year old dad can can laugh at, you know. So um, you're able to, but yeah, it's definitely that could have easily been cut at any minute if someone got nervous, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the the concept that he's been naked the whole time, like throughout the other three movies, is, you know, I, I guess part of that is 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 an adult joke because you have to really sort of think it through. But the, well, um, it was it was logical in a way because we kind of thought like, well, either we only see his glasses, so either all of his clothes are affected by whatever is making him invisible, or the logical scenario is that he's just wearing his glasses. Um, in the uh, in the synopsis for the film, it refers to this movie as the final installment. And, you know, in, in, in so many ways, um, it really does feel like the sort of the passing of the torch, you know, giving away the hotel and all of that. Um, but I'm curious if that was, if that was always sort of the intention from a writing standpoint, if they were like, you know, uh, from the, from the pitch, from the moment of the pitch that this would be sort of a conclusion to this this concept. I mean, it feels like nothing ultimately ever really ends in the world of franchises. Um, but you know, it does feel like Drax's story comes to a nice sort of resolution. So I'm curious if that was uh, a defining part of the script from the beginning. It was definitely talked about early on, and as as this as it got, you know, as we went along and it got more real that we were going to make this movie, um, mm -hmm. there there was a lot of talk. You know, because there's a lot of people involved. Uh, from the other, you know, once you get to a, a fourth movie, there's, there's there's so many people have been involved with it all along, and, and everybody's kind of weighing in, and so everybody, you know, wants the, you know, like you said, the the kind of the finishing of this story of the character, and trying to give them, you know, a, you know, full full, you know, full arc from the first movie. So it definitely was 
definitely was written and created with that in mind that, you know, whether or not it's the final one or not, who knows, you know, like you said, you never quite know, but, but uh, if this is the final one, hopefully it has a satisfactory, you know, wrap up for, for anybody that's been tracking the movies all along. And then hopefully on the other hand, it just holds up as a single, you know, if you've never seen any other one of them, but this, you know, you can still enjoy it. Definitely. I'm curious with all of the um, comedians that you have on board, particularly, uh, there's obviously a lot of people from the uh, SNL cast. Um, is there ever any kind of back and forth with them about the jokes or do they come in, do the script and you animate, do you animate first and then bring them in for the voiceover? How does it work? It depends. It really depends on, on the actor and, and sort of what, what excites them really. Um, we had a, you know, a couple of them were just, you know, wanted to come in and just really dig into the joke and like people like David Spade, like will get the joke and then he will just ad lib for days and it's hilarious. Yeah. And then with, you know, David Spade's a good example of someone who he'll ad lib a bunch of stuff and then we'll take those lines back into editorial and then we'll rework the sequence around some of his funny lines. So that's a case where the actor is really adding, you know, and bringing something different. And then there's other, there's other actors who are, you know, like Jim Gaffigan, someone who he'll really analyze all the lines and he wants to understand why the character is saying every single line. And as a director, you have to be able to have an answer. It can't just be well, because, you know, like you have to really be able to answer his questions and give him, you know, he needs that feedback f to understand what he's saying. So every actor is different every actor brings something different to it but it, it's it's always a creative process when you when you work with an actor because you know it's just another set of ideas and they're looking at it fresh for a lot of times they're looking at the script for the first time and so they they'll have ideas they'll have questions they'll have things and as a director you have to you know you kind of make up things on, on the spot yeah I, th I think another good example is that like all the characters are sort of anchored by their voice, like their voice is what anchors them in their both their forms, apart from Murray. Murray becomes, you know, he's an ancient mummy, so he becomes an ancient person. And so the, the quality of Murray's voice changed. So that was, a, a, finding that character with Keegan was actually really a, a really fun process because the, the humor of what that was, was something that he, again, delved really deeply into and was another great one for just ad-libbing and coming up with these great bits for, for what like an old Murray could sound like. Um, how different is the finished film from the script when you first started? Oh gosh, I think it's all <laughs> super different. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I think... you know, this is, a, this is unusual because this was, you know, we were kind of making the, making the film while it was being written you know which is like maybe that's not unusual in animation uh so the 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 script is informing the editorial but at the same time we're we're re, you know again david spade writes a bunch of new lines ad libs them you know we rework the sequence in editorial that informs the script so it's really you don't it's not like you get a script it's finished it's locked it's done then you get to make it that would be really, really easy and wonderful. But that's, I don't, I don't know if that's ever happened. It's really like you get the script and it's like, you know, it's maybe if you're lucky, it's 70% there. And then you you kind of rework it and tape it together. And, and then, you know, everything is, you know, you're handing it back. There's, we have the, our, our script uh, coordinator is, it's, it's probably the worst job on the planet because she has to like, she's rewriting that thing. I mean, wasn't she writing, re, like reworking the script, like even when we we're mixing, like, because she's got to conform the whole thing. And she was just up a lot of late nights just trying to like, what did they say? And what, you know, she's watching the movie and putting it in. And... Um, I'm, I'm curious if your your process uh, was significantly different from having made the film. Was the, were you, you making the film during the pandemic? Almost entirely. Yeah. Uh, uh, I th what happened was, so I had started a little bit early and we were making uh, a short, which was uh, the Monster Pets uh, short. And it was sort of the idea would be that, you know, it'd be a nice testing ground to get used to the process and the assets and Derek came on and that was great. And then I think Derek, cause you started in December and, and there was like a, a, a slightly new take with, you know, everyone transforming. That was a, that was very, very new, very sort of like just getting baked. And so we were really kind of in script uh, at the end of 2019. 
and then 2020 rolls around and then we basically lock down immediately. I think we had- March, we, right? Wasn't it like March? With March. And I think we had had one sequence that we had just gotten into edit. We had just gotten into edit on like one sequence. It was sort of, it was Drax transformation and we were, it was sort of even without script. We were exploring it in boards, like really kind of seeing what that could look like. And then we saw, we saw it once in edit and then the next week we got sent home. And so effectively the whole movie was made in lockdown. Basically the views that you're seeing yeah, yeah. in right now, this is what we saw each other for the whole film. But what was that like for the actors? So what was the process of reporting their audio? Oh, so varied. Oh my gosh. It was never the same for anyone, eh, Derek? Yeah, like for Brian Hull, he was, it, and you know, it all kind of worked out with what you were allowed to do when he was right. ready to come into the studio. So, you know, we would, we would go in, we have an engineer and then I would go in, I would go in and then, um, and Brian was there and the Jen was on the, on the computer and the producers were on the computer. And so that was a case where we were at least one of us was able to be with him in the same room. But then other times we had like, like Jen, you, you, you recorded friend Drescher. That's always a funny story. Oh yeah. So, so the people who couldn't get to studios either because of lockdown or, or, or any other scenarios, we had some people who would record on their own in a studio and we would call in and other people we just got in their closets or in their bedrooms like like uh Catherine Hahn was entirely in her closet that sort of like she made up as like just to soundproof as much as possible and then Fran Drescher we got and I love this story because it's so what you do in a pandemic where we get to meet everyone's pets in fact I forgot to lock a cat out so you might hear him like screaming in the background uh, any moment but uh so so Fran was was, you know, Eunice is a big, loud character. And we were doing a scene in Act Three where, you know, everything is falling apart and Fran's screaming her head off. And then, you know, she's got a mic set up and from out of nowhere, this giant German shepherd runs in and starts like licking her face, thinking that she's in some sort of distress, knocks the mic over. And it's just very indicative of like the whole process of, of sort of making this movie and adapting to trying to work at home. And what an odd process that was. I've heard stories of the, the closet uh, recording studios. I'm glad it worked out. Um, <laughs> yeah. Part of, I'm sure, the joy of making films like this, though, is to also, um, you know, hear kids laughing. And obviously, you know, we're in a situation where that gets to be, you know, very difficult. But I'm curious if you did any kind of uh, testing with a live audience to get a sense of things that, you know, you might want to tweak or jokes you wanted to replace or anything like that. Is that, was that off the table or did you do anything? It, it, we, we tried a couple times, I think, Derek, but there was a, sort of like a maybe, maybe, but effectively it was. Yeah, we, we, could. We, were, we, we were right in the heart of it. Yeah. You know, when we were, when we were wrapping, when we were kind of getting to the part where we could test, it was spring, you know, of tw right 20 of 21, was it? Yeah. So it was, you know, things were calming down a little bit, but it still was, it was it just, you know. The movie time, was definitely. Yeah, by the time we were mixing, it was the summer. And that's when, like, just before Delta came out. So that was, like, that was a window where we were able to actually record with a symphony and have them all in the same room. Like, there's just this little window. But, like, two months before that, nobody was allowed to go, you know, to go, you know, you weren't allowed to go more than 10 people in a room or whatever. So, so no, we didn't have the chance to, the first time we saw it with an audience was when we showed it to the crew. And uh, I think we all had notes and thoughts of things we wanted to change, <laughs> but you know, it, it didn't happen. So yeah, so. We, we got a couple of, uh, you know, the, the, the edit staff who sort of had the version of the film most like in their, you know, in their possession. Like, so we get a couple of like, oh, my kids like this scene, my kids like that scene, like maybe not that one. So like, so like the most people we got, I think was from our editor's children. And that was, that was really it. Like that's all we were really allowed to do. Um, just one, one last thing, and then we'll take some of these questions from the audience. Uh, uh, the franchise always has great music in it, and uh, and always something really fantastic over the um, animated end credits. How involved are you in the creation of that song? I mean, do you do you wor work with artists on on um, so like the the lyrics uh, just because they they're tailored for like the the content of the movie, or do you just you know say write us a song? And, uh, and give them free reign. I think in that version, uh, Gindry, who was our artist who did the, the, the end credits, I, 
what really happened and it was kind of lovely was that you know everyone was locked down and she got a copy of the movie and she really sort of latched on to this idea of of family and, and being accepted for who you are and we kind of got a demo of the song and it was it was pretty much as as you see it we you know we, we kind of pushed and pulled because we needed some more time for some of the credits but it was really just this really great toe tapping song which, with a great message and we we didn't really change much at all in, in terms of its content um i uh by the way I'm, I'm thrilled that you you brought back the gremlins <laughs> i have actually i keep this this guy nearby <laughs> Yeah, they were super fun. I mean, that's that's the great thing with a franchise, right? Is you end up, especially once you get to like a four, where you're spoiled for choice with this cast of characters and who are you gonna bring, gonna bring back and who gets a cameo and who doesn't, and it's just they're just so much fun to play with. Um, let me let me see what we got in the Q and A box. Um, so uh, okay, so uh, Rahun Sharma is asking, uh, what's it like to work with such talented people in the industry? Uh, talking about how spectacular the cast. Is. I mean, I mean, you want to talk about that, Derek? I know you you got to spend a bit more time with them, but yeah, you know, well, when when you do a feature, you know, it, you know, for, you know, we're all just normal people, you know, who you know don't, you know, we don't hang out at Beverly Hills or anything. So uh, you get to meet and and work with you know professional trained actors uh, who are, I mean, they're just they're the best in in the world at what they do. So it's pretty exciting, and you know, a lot of them are people that you know we've seen in movies or tv shows so there's definitely the, the fan side of it where it's super exciting just to kind of you know be able to tell your your family who I've, i met this person or that person but then there's the other side there's a professional side of it of like okay well we got to get this done and you know i would not on this movie but i've been on movies on, on projects where it's like you know the celebrity you know it's a pretty big time celebrity and they're not you know they're distracted and they're not they're not giving you what you need and you have to kind of be I don't know. You have to just kind of say, "Hey, look, man, we we we're, we got it. We need this. Like, you got to really, you got to bring it, you know." And so, you know, and you know, and they're, you know, for the most part, people are like, you know, once you get into a room and you're all working together, then all that like celebrity stuff goes away, and it's just about people, you know, everybody has their skills, and and uh, and and you just kind of get down to it and work. So it's, it, you know, the great thing is that these are the best in the world. So like, when it's time to go, ninety percent of the time, those they are, you know, it makes your job as a director pretty easy you know at the same time when, when you're kind of telling steve buscemi that you need him to scream more horrifically because he's seeing griffin's like naked butt it's like it, it, you start to sort of like check what you're doing like oh this is a bizarre scenario also yeah. as well, well yeah, you gotta be yeah you gotta be conscious of the fact that like you know not you know people don't want to scream it you know it hurts their voice and that's their tool and that's how they make a living and so you have to you know on one hand you want to you want to get everything you want to get but on the other hand you're like okay i got to be considerate and so let's let's just scream twice and you know give you all the information this is the kind of scream it's a you're looking at an ass and it's that is freaking you out like it's that's the kind of scream i need and give them all that information up front so they only have to do it once if most twice um, okay, this question is from uh, Arjit. Uh, who's your favorite character, and what's your favorite character's favorite food? Um, and that does really remind me of how many great um, food sequences there are throughout the franchise. Curious if there was also a particular favorite dish you, you enjoyed coming up with. Oh gosh, yeah, not in this one as much. I know, I know, in in in, in previous ones, you know, we we had your monster ball soup and your scream cheese. Uh, which which were always like fun. I, I'm st we had a sequence that we cut. Remember? Oh, yes, talk about that one. That one was great. Yeah, we had a scene where they were like we were doing all these monster hors d'oeuvres at like a, at the at the uh, what turned into Drax speech. There was a there was like a pre party hors d'oeuvre hour, and we just had some of the zombies you know delivering all these different um, different foods and stuff. So that was kind of a kind of, you know, just like a fun moment to to invent you know screaming meatballs and you know eyeballs and the joke was that there was finger foods and the zombies were leaving fingers in yeah know, right that was awesome. <laughs> so that so that was that was one that i'm on the color kind of room floor. what was the question like who's your favorite character mm -hmm. oh gosh i mean in 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 this movie like anything that griffin says makes me laugh <laughs> yeah, that's uh, true. yeah he was uh, yeah, with david spade of you know and, and, and van helsing was really fun yeah van helsing with, you know uh gafkin is is just brings such a weird element 
it, you know something you didn't plan on the things he does with those voices it's you don't really plan on it and then you and you then it creates something new and then being able to take his body we you know we kind of had it like reshape into the different forms to go through the the the, the maze that was all pretty fun mm. and i would say for me johnny was probably yeah that he was fun too because it was the you know out of he was the one character we could kind of create you know in a way even though the personality was there like we, we were able to design a whole new you know body and then he did things that he hadn't done in the other movies so it's kind of a you know we were able to really be creative with with that character and and you know it wasn't overwhelmed it wasn't like we had to be creative with 20 characters it was like we could everyone else is pretty much nailed down and here's how this you know this one guy we can really concentrate on yeah he was great uh okay this question is from young um i feel what makes hotel transylvania's physical humor and action stand out is being able to carry the sharp energy from the storyboard and animatic into the animation, the signature of Dendi Tartakovsky's unique visual style. What was it like maintaining this unique style and taking over for the fourth film? Well, the, the one thing that's great about you know Sony Animation is that so many of the animators have come up with these films, and so the, the institutional knowledge that's baked into you know the the franchise and, and into the animators is is really profound and. And I think Gendy really did sort of define a, a different type of animation that you hadn't really seen in CG up to this point. And every sort of film of the of the Hotel T franchises pushes it further and further. And you really get this sort of great pose-based animation that is is deceptively difficult to do and and is really quite amazing and very specific. And when you combine that with really amazing board artists, um, it it is just absolutely awesome. There's a scene I'm thinking of in particular, which was the scene where Johnny is rampaging through the uh, the hallway when he's sort of looking for for Mavis, and that was an early early scene in in production. I think it's a great combination of animation and and boards. It was boarded by Dave Feist, you know, amazing, you know. Uh, board artist, like lots big history with with TV animation. Anyone who knows Cal and Chicken will know that name. Uh, anyway, so he bore this amazing scene, which, which was huge physicality, amazing poses, very, very pushed. And the great thing about Hotel T as a franchise is that it's never been precious about model. It's always been very much that the animators are really allowed to shine. And so if, an an if the animation style shifts a little bit from shot to shot, that's totally fine, as long as the shot is funny and everything that's happening is really funny. And that was because it was one of the first scenes in animation it was the scene in which everyone was playing with Johnny Monster for the first time. So if you watch that sequence, like the way in which he's moving and how he locomotes, like changes massively from shot to shot. Like it's all over the place, but it works because he's exploring this new body as the animators are sort of playing with this new rig for the first time. And it's absolutely great. Um, let's, uh, we'll take this last one from David Seidman. And it's really a question about, I guess, breaking in. Uh, the question is, are you open to hiring artists who may not have experience in boarding, but do have experience in drawing and writing comics? And I guess my, to, to sort of make that a bigger question for everyone out there, um, what, what, what sort of is the process for hiring artists and, and you know, people getting, breaking into the uh, animation world? Gosh, well, you know, it's the, the thing you could count on is everybody you talk to will have a different story about how they broke in and there isn't, you know, how I got in, if I told you that that world doesn't exist anymore, you know, and same with Jen, like it, it so, um, so that's on one side, uh, uh, you know, experience can't hurt, you know, and, and it's, it's tough when you, you know, getting right out of school is hard because you're not only competing with everybody that you're graduating with, you're also competing with everybody that's out there who's been graduating, who've been graduating for the last, you know, 25 years. It's all kind of this level playing field. No one really cares about where you've been or what you've done for the most part. It's really like, what, what, you know, what's your portfolio? What do you have? You know, I need, I need funny people or I need emotional actors or I, you know, I need, you know, I need people that can draw this certain style. And so every movie or TV show is casting with a specific thing in mind. Um, and how, you know, you as an artist, how do you, what are you presenting and, and do you fit in with yeah. that, that specific thing? And using Hotel T as an example, like like going back to, to this movie and the past movies, like you, you would find the boarding cast was really, really broad. You'd have people who come from live action who are just like 
the most ridiculous, amazing, you know, cinematographers and like action board artists you've ever seen. At the same time, you've got other people who they are, they are writers. They are primarily writers and they draw a little bit enough to get the joke across, but it's, it's sometimes it's not much, you know, broader than stick figures. And, and those two people can exist on the crew together. And most, you know, crews are better for it, for having that broad range of, of skill sets. Well, thank you both so much. Thank you so much for such a great movie. And it's going to be available for everyone on uh, January 14th, exclusively on Amazon Prime. So um, uh, thank you so much. And I hope we can do this again sometime. Well, thank you so much for having us. It was really fun. Yeah, great. Good night, everyone. All right. Night.